The patient is positioned supine. Tilt the head back on the C1 joint while keeping the mouth closed. The head should remain in the neutral position. The chin lift elevates and anteriorly displaces the hyoid bone away from the pharyngeal wall. Open the mouth slightly. Depress the mandible with thumbs. Grip the mandibular rami with your fingers and lift the mandibular teeth over and in front of maxillary teeth. This is a two-handed technique. Patient positioning should be supine or lateral. Open the patient's mouth. Place the tongue blade at the base of the tongue. Draw the tongue anteriorly to lift it off the pharynx. Place the airway in the mouth with the concave side facing down so that the distal end is approximating but not touching the posterior wall of the oropharynx. The flange at one to two centimeters of the shaft of the airway should protrude above the incisors. Perform the jaw thrust maneuver to lift the tongue off the pharyngeal wall. Now tap the airway down the last two centimeters so that the curve lies beyond the base of the tongue. Anesthesia is administered when placing the nasal airway device. The patency of the nares should be gauged by inspection and the mirror test, condensation. A topical slurry composed of 10 mg phenylephrine in 10 milliliters of 2% lidocaine jelly is applied. This provides anesthesia and vasoconstriction of the nasal airway. The lidocaine jelly mixture is swabbed just inside the external edge of nares until local anesthesia occurs. Gently place successive swabs deeper into nares until three swabs can comfortably be placed simultaneously to the level of the posterior nasal wall. If three cotton swabs can be accommodated, then a 7.5 millimeter airway will pass. If swabs are not available, then the lidocaine slurry can be applied via a syringe directly into the nose. The patient positioning may be supine, lateral, or sitting. Pass the airway gently into the nose with the concave side facing the hard palate. If resistance is met in the posterior pharynx, bend the tube 60 to 90 degrees with gentle pressure and proceed down the pharynx. If the airway will not pass with moderate pressure, it may be helpful to rotate the airway 90 degrees counterclockwise and then rotate it back to the original position as it makes the bend down the pharynx. If the airway still does not pass, a narrower tube should be used. Once inserted, withdraw the tube two centimeters and pass a small suction catheter through it. Push the airway forward using the catheter as a guide. If it is still unsuccessful, the nair can be redilated or the other nair can be prepared. Positioning should be supine. Place an oral or nasal airway. Hold the mask in the left hand. With the thumb and index finger, grip the mask around the rim of the mask with the body of the mask fitting into the left palm. Place the narrow end of the mask over the nose. Avoid pressure on the eyes. Lower the body of the mask to the face so the chin section of the mask rests on the alveolar ridge. Seal the contact areas with the midsection of the face by pulling the mandible up into the mask with the curled fingers of the left hand. Then deliver intermittent breaths with the right hand on the ambu bag. In a spontaneously breathing patient, time the delivered breaths to coincide with the patient's inhalations. In the tachypnic patient, Alternate the assisted breaths with spontaneous respirations. Buckle gauze sponges can be placed in the cheeks of an edentionless patient to improve fit to the face. If the patient is already horizontal and unconscious, or if oral intubation is planned, the patient's position should be supine with the head in the sniffing position. If the patient cannot tolerate lying flat, the patient may remain sitting for blind nasal intubation. 
Check the endotracheal tube cuff for leaks by inflating and deflating the balloon with 10 milliliters of air. Check the laryngoscope to ensure the light is functioning. Pre-oxygenate the patient with bag mask ventilation. Have an assistant apply cricoid pressure using the Selic maneuver. Remove the oral airway. Grasp the laryngoscope in the left hand. Instruct the awake patient to open the mouth as widely as possible. In the unconscious patient, place the thumb and second fingers of the right hand on the right upper and lower molars and open the mouth with a scissor-like motion. Gently place the laryngoscope blade in the right side of the mouth, taking care to avoid damaging the teeth. Sweep the tongue to one side of the oral cavity while advancing the laryngoscope blade toward the glottis. Position the end of the blade under the epiglottis or in the vallecula, depending on the type of blade used. Avoid cocking the left wrist backward and levering the blade on the teeth. Lift the laryngoscope handle straight up till the vocal cords are visualized. Pass the styleted tube with the cuff deflated into the right side of the mouth and through the vocal cords. Remove the stylet as the cuff passes through the vocal cords. Then place the endotracheal tube so that the cuff is just distal to the cords and cannot be seen between or above the cords. Inflate the balloon with 5 to 10 milliliters of air and hold the tube firmly in place at the lips. Now, place an end tidal CO2 monitor in the breathing circuit between the tube adapter and the ventilator bag. Gently give several breaths. Watch the chest for expansion. Check a minimum of six breaths for measurement of CO2 on the CO2 monitor. This is to ensure that CO2 returned to the breathing circuit has a pulmonary source and is not insufflated air from the stomach. Listen for bilateral breath sounds over the chest and for an absence of sounds over the gastric area. If all clinical signs point to intubation of the trachea, the assistant may then release the cricoid. Tape the tube securely and carefully place a bite block in the awake patient to avoid obstruction of the tube from biting. Obtain a chest x-ray to check endotracheal tube placement. If more than one intubation attempt is necessary, the patient should have a 100% oxygen bag mask airway re-established between attempts. If the esophagus is intubated inadvertently, in cases where the vocal cords are difficult to visualize, it may be helpful to leave the endotracheal tube in place as a marker to avoid repeated esophageal placements. Inadequate mouth opening is the most common mistake making laryngoscopy difficult as well as greatly increasing the risk of damage to the teeth. Nasal intubation is generally done in the awake, spontaneously breathing patient when there is an advantage to avoiding laryngoscopy, such as with a cervical neck fracture. Check the endotracheal tube cuff for leaks by inflating and deflating the balloon with 10 milliliters of air. Coat the end and cuff of the unstyleted tube with viscous lidocaine jelly. If warm saline is available, the tube may first be soaked for three minutes and then the procedure is performed. Place the tube gently in the nose and advance it using the technique described for the nasal airway. Gently extend the neck if the tube is difficult to pass. Watch for signs of fogging or condensation in the tube as the tube approaches the vocal cords. The quality of the voice may also change. Ask the patient to breathe deeply and gently advance the tube through the cords while they are open during the inspiration. The patient should immediately lose phonation, inflate the cuff, verify position, and secure as for an oral endotracheal tube.